You guys sitting up straight out there, you better had. All right, now. Fifty years ago, I became a student of the Ageless Wisdom Teachings. Forty-six years ago, my Halloween costume depicted me as Dr. John D., a hero of mine and still is. Over all those decades, I consumed research on Brother John D. from Jeffrey James, Peter French, Gerald Scholler, John H. Peterson, remember him? And most importantly, a very dear friend of ours, Dame Lady Francis A. Yates, and, and, ah oh yes, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, who was, of course, my favorite. Until tonight, when I read Jason Louv's book, John D. and the Empire of Angels, a Nokian magic and occult roots of the modern world, published by our friends, Inner Traditions International. He's joining us tonight for both hours. Now, presenting a comprehensive overview of D.'s life and work, Louv examines his scientific achievements intelligence and spy work, imperial strategizing, excuse me, and, and Anakian magic, establishing a psycho-history of John D. as a singular force and fundamental driver of Western history, exploring D.'s influence on Sir Francis Bacon, another one of my favorites there, and the development of modern science, 17th century Rosicrucianism, of course, which, which both Laura and I are members of, and the 19th century occult revival and 20th century occultists such as Jack Parsons. Remember Jack Parsons? What about Aleister Crowley and Anton LaVey? Louvre shows how John D. continues to impact science and the occult to this day. Jason Louvre is the author of seven books, including Generation Hex, Ultra Culture, and The Psychic Bible. He runs the high-traffic site ultraculture.org and teaches courses on magic and spirituality at magic.me. He has written for many popular websites, including Boing Boing, Vice, Vice News, Motherboard, and Esquire Online, and he lives... In Los Angeles, good old Los Angeles, and that's where the Woodstock bus is right now getting all fixed up to come east. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Jason. Oh, thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to be here. Well, and I, great to meet you. I'm more excited than you are. Don't you tell me. Are you sitting up straight? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you... I'm, yes. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll sit up straight. Now, uh, okay. Now, I, it took me a long time to read your book, but I read every page, and it serves me right. Well, uh, first, why don't you tell me just about yourself and your background? Sure. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a journalist, as you, as you mentioned, as you referred to, and I've, I've you know, been a, a writer uh, for my whole life for, on various topics. The esoteric has been a, one of my primary interests uh, because I think it's a fascinating way to understand. Understanding the esoteric side of life is really shines some really fascinating light on both history and human beings. Because I think for me, the most interesting things is the most the most interesting thing is human beings and what they believe. And I feel that if we can get a good model of what human beings have what what people have believed throughout history, then we. We, un we can understand history. Um, but I've certainly been involved in exploring the esoteric side of life in a, a journalistic and in a hands-on way for the last 20 years. And uh, I've gone all over the world to learn about all kinds of things from Nepali shamanism in the foothills of the Himalayas and yoga up higher in the Himalayas to, you know, the Western magical tradition, alchemy, uh, Kabbalah, ceremonial magic all these things. And so uh, I've had a lot of crazy adventures. And yeah, this is my my eighth book and 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 definitely the one that I'm most proud of so far. And it is a huge book, as you mentioned. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's the best I've ever read. There's no doubt Thank about you. that. That's high praise, especially you, you mentioned so many other great authors and who I feel I stand in the shadow of. Um, but uh, so that's very high praise, you know, Francis Yates and and so on. Well, you, you're standing on all their shoulders, but now other people are going to have to stand on yours. 
Sure. Now, who was John D, and and why was he important? So John D was the scientific advisor to Queen Elizabeth I in the 16th century in England, and he was a real Renaissance man. You know, he's a guy that knew everything at a time when it was still possible to do that, and when you could still learn and, and read all of the material that had been written. So he was a master of science and mathematics and astronomy and, and also the occult sciences like astrology and, uh, and summoning spirits and all kinds of wild and woolly things. And he was, you know, a true Mr. Wizard, as, as they say. Hey, just and, like you. <laughs> yeah, <Well>. that's right. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, and he, the reason that he's so important is because he really stood at the crossroads between the Dark Ages and the Renaissance and then the modern world. And he's the person that came up with the phrase British Empire. He's the person who invented and laid out the schematics, uh, the plan for uh, England colonizing the world and creating the British Empire. Um, and he's the person that brought knowledge of higher mathematics to the British population for the first time. And the reason that's important is because in looking at this individual, we can see somebody who's almost, at least in my opinion, I won't say single-handedly responsible, but one of the top most responsible people for the way that world history turned and the creation of things like the British Empire and then, of course, America. Um, and then, of course, and he's a pretty pretty exciting character also because he spent over 10 years, maybe 20 years, attempting to contact angels because by his 50s he decided that he had learned everything there was to learn about, um, you know, from from humans, of, of mortal science, and decided that if he, only, he was going to learn anything more, then he would have to speak to the angels themselves. And he left thousands of pages of diaries of, of his attempts to contact angels with a, a psychic name, Edward Kelly, which are pretty, you know, certainly fascinating, maybe a bit convincing and, and definitely harrowing in some parts. But he's he fascinates me because he's just a tremendous intellect and, and somebody who was able to see the world from so many different angles, scientific, mathematic, magical, and, and synthesize an incredibly compelling worldview and a worldview that hasn't been written about um, uh, did, well, I felt had not been written about fully, and, and so I felt compelled to do the, the definitive book about it. Well, you deserve at least two PhDs on this book. <laughs> Thank you, you. Yeah, you do. You do. But the point is, it's that kind of quality work. Anyway, you know, you note that the influence of Dee's, uh, the angelic system, he and uh, Kelly delivered to the world can be found in an astonishing number of major turning points of Western history since uh, Dee's death. Would you please give us uh, just a few examples of that? Absolutely. So, of course, the primary one is the creation of the British Empire, uh, for which he was never properly credited because he was kind of written out of history uh, because his occult activities were so strange and potentially embarrassing to the British establishment and also the early, the, the birth of early modern science, um, that he was kind of swept under the rug, unfortunately, which is quite unfair to him because none of this would have happened without him. Yeah, that's right. Um, but outside of that, I mean, if we, if we go forward in history, you know, Dee's work, in, in, at least in the occult world, certainly underlies the creation of everything from Freemasonry to Rosicrucianism to uh, more recent occult movements like the Golden Dawn and Aleister Crowley's Thelema and you know, modern neo-paganism. It's a straight line all the way through. All of these, really every single occult or a cultural or new age or neo-pagan movement since Dee's time has almost invariably been constructed around a core of his work, uh, even though most of the adherents of those groups have not fully understood his work or even directly engaged in it. It's always been sitting there at the core as the, the, the lofty heights of the occult. Uh, but besides that, I mean, we can certainly see his influence in, of course, the Age of Empires and exploration and... And then even things like the modern space program. You mentioned Jack Parsons at the beginning of the show, somebody yeah. who's thankfully a bit more well-known because he's currently the star of a, a TV show on CBS All Access, you know, the, the Strange Angel. 
which is about his life. Jack Parsons was a rocket scientist in the 1930s and 40s in Pasadena, California, who was one of the early pioneers of rocketry and was the founder of Jet Propulsion Laboratories, which was later acquired by NASA and invented the rocket fuel that got us to the moon. Uh, Jack Parsons was a very keen student of both Aleister Crowley and John Dee's work and of Enochian magic in particular, and spent a, a lot of time experimenting with it uh, in the Mojave Desert with his his friend L. Ron Hubbard, who he probably shouldn't have trusted as much as he did. Um, uh, and that's a whole other sordid and fascinating story. Um, but th that right there is at the core of the the foundation of the modern space program, just like Dee's work in the 16th century was at the core of the foundation of the British Empire. And if all of this sounds completely bizarre to you and mind spinning and perhaps all over the place, then this is the, the shape of history. And, and you're, you're now in the place that I was trying to make sense of this and piece together. Really, what we're looking at is how the occult has shaped world history and how the the, the strange and and and, and very complex world of occultism and magic has intersected with the forces that have shaped everything from the creation of the British Empire to the American Empire to the space program and humanity's attempts to get off world. It's a, you know, the, the book covers 500 years of history, starting with John Dee and, as you, as you mentioned, expanding forward into the, the influence of his work on history. It's the greatest story never told, as they say. Yeah, it sure is, and you write so well too. Now, uh, the we're going to have to take a break here, but when we come back, your work is unique in a number of ways, um, especially in regards to, say, for instance, what my, my next question is going to be, and you can study up on this, okay, because uh, you can check and check your own your book on your, on what. Here's the question: What is the great chain of being? Do you think you can handle that one for us when we come back? Absolutely. Good going. All right. Time out here on the playing field with Jason Louv, John D. and the Empire, Empire of Angels, Anakian Magic, and the Occult Roots of the Modern World, Inner Traditions International, on the web, jasonlouv.com, or here's, a, here's an easier one, magic.me. That's a pretty good one. This is Mitch Horowitz, the author of Occult America, and you are listening to Dr. Bob Hieronymus on 21st Century Radio. This is the place to be for information about everything you love in the world of esoterica, the occult, and alternative spirituality. Are you, are you still with us, Jason? Still with you. It's All cool right. to hear Mitch there. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He's a cool guy. Oh, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, he's a... Um... Oh, no, I can't get I wish we can get into them. I haven't seen him in a couple of years. Now, all right, now, now, now you've had time to brush up on the most important, well, to me, one of the most important parts of the book, which which I don't believe any of the other people that I read on on uh, our, our dear friend John D. Uh, ever talked about, and that is the great chain of being. What is the great chain of being? So the great chain of being is how everyone saw the world in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And it's how people under, it's how people saw the world before the scientific revolution really shook every, all everyone's assumptions up. And it was very simple. It was that God was the center of the universe or the very top of being. And, and from him descended the angels and from the angels descended humanity and below them was animals and below animals were plants and then minerals and so on. And, and the idea was that all of creation was a nested hierarchy and that everything in, in creation was ranked and put into perfect order. So, for instance, there were nine ranks of angels and there were ranks of, of people, you know, the, the, the different uh, classes and castes essentially in the Middle Ages. So in the, the world of men, the king was the head of men and then the you know, nobility and then clergy descended below him and so on and so forth. And so before, and this, of course, was when people thought that the um, that the sun revolved around the earth. So they also believed that the heavenly bodies were a nested hierarchy proceeding outwards from the earth. And of course, they thought would think that we, we can't fault them for not having more modern scientific uh, instruments and mathematical understanding of things. But it was uh, it was how, how do I put it? 
it was a worldview that was wrong, at least by our current understanding of things. However, it was a worldview that was very, very comforting to people in a way. It was a worldview that suggested that everything was perfectly ordered and constructed. And I think that that's very comforting for people. I don't. I think that people are very fundamentally discomforted by the idea that the universe is chaotic or that there's no meaning or order to it, uh, which is what we kind of believe now, uh, largely. Because to the medieval mind, if there was chaos, so if you, if you think that the world is perfectly ordered, well, why do things go wrong? Why is there chaos? Why, why, and, and, and why does the system break down sometimes? And the conclusion that they came to was that it had to be the effect of sin. Human beings had been given free will by God as a necessity of being human. And so they could, of course, of their own free will, choose to sin or they wouldn't be human. They wouldn't have free will. So, but the, the effects of sin were always chaos. You know, that was a clear cause and effect. It's very similar to the Eastern idea of karma. You know, what you do comes back to you. And so if there was anything wrong, like, for instance, the Black Plague or so, something like that, then it had to be the results of human sin. And uh, so that's, of course, where this model breaks down because people were blaming themselves for things that just weren't their fault. But uh, at least not in that way, maybe in the, the, their fault for not having good sanitation and minding fleas and that type of thing. But this was the medieval view of the world. And, and so um, the reason that this was important is for esoteric thinkers, it meant that reality c could not only be understood, but that one could come closer to God by ceasing one's, uh, you know, overcoming one's own uh, sinful nature and thereby ascending the great chain of being to become more like the angels was to reach upward on the scale of evolution, uh, an idea that's also very common in, in Eastern mysticism and Sufism and things like that. Uh, the, so the idea was to become more like the angels, one would have to speak to the angels. And this is where magic came in. The whole point of you know white magic, if we might call it that, was to come closer to God by speaking with his spiritual intermediaries, angels, because you know, as we all know, in our own lives, the people that we spend all of our time with are the people that we become. If you have a, a positive and supportive group of friends, you're going to be very different than if you have a, a group of, of friends who are not supportive and are backbiting and, and uh, destructive and that type of thing. But if, you're, if your circle of acquaintances is, is angels, well, then you're, you're going to become much more like them simply by the effect of peer pressure. So that was kind of the idea with, with ceremonial magic, you know, to become closer to God, speak to, you can't speak directly to God because he's too far away. He's too uh, abstract in a way and, and not concerned with the affairs perhaps of individual mortals as much as that of his entire creation. So the idea is, well, you need to, get, if you're going to, if you're going to dial if you're going to phone home, if you're going to dial up to the celestial realms, well, then you better get a minor functionary or a you know receptionist, receptionist who's you know able to take your call and give you the time of day, and maybe they can direct your your inquiries or your prayers to the people who are capable of fulfilling them. This was really the medieval conception, and it's the conception that, that underlies a lot of magical systems throughout the world or sure. spiritual systems. Yeah. Well, I got to say that your illustrations, I don't know, I think you have 14,922 of them, and many of them I've seen before, but there are quite a number that I haven't. So congratulations on that. Jeez, oh whiz. Um, oops, well, now. What were Dee's scientific, mathematical, and intelligence contributions to Elizabethan England? So Dee is fascinating in this regard because although he was lauded as the most intelligent man of his era, I mean, and, and by way of illustrating that beyond even his just his accomplishments, Dee at Mortlake, which was his home in southwest London, assembled the premier scientific library of the Renaissance. It was five times the size of Oxford and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he spent his entire adult life collecting books and, you know, lived his entire life in deep debt in order to collect more books, you know, uh, something that students of the occult can perhaps sympathize with. Yeah. But he, um, so what he really did is lay the groundwork for modern science. And he didn't have any scientific, real scientific breakthroughs of his own in the way, not in the sense that perhaps Galileo or Kepler did. He didn't have a big discovery or a big theory. But what he did was he, he prepared the, he, he prepared the way by not only by 
importing the idea of science from the continent to England, but also assembling that library, using it to create a salon and an incubator for all of the brightest young scientific and mathematical minds of England, where they could come and read books and, and, and converse with each other, and also by teaching math to the English public for the first time. So he, he was a great, great educator. And, and the, the generation that followed Deeg, you know, the, kept, the, the ones that made the big uh, uh, breakthroughs, um, the, the Tycho Brays and people like this, you know, they were uh, nurtured in the environment that uh, D created and, and fostered. So he was kind of like a, you know, the, the great, the, the grandfather, the, the kindly grandfather of what became modern science. And of course, the, a lot of his ideas went into it as well. Um, and it, it, primarily the idea that there should be a scientific revolution, uh, which we can trace back to D. The idea that, you know, it was really D's idea. D, you have to imagine D looking around at England at the time and people being burned at the stake and religious warfare and and all kinds of misery and poverty and people starving. And, and you have to imagine somebody this intelligent looking around and saying, how can humanity's lot be improved? Uh, much like many people today must look at the world and think. And he came to the conclusion that it was it was science and mathematics and the light of uh, empirical investigation into the nature of reality, including in the divine realms, would lift people out of superstition and dogma and ignorance and fear because people lived in fear and they lived in mm -hmm. fear of of the uh, of, of Queen Mary before Elizabeth. They lived in fear of uh, super their own superstitious beliefs of the supernatural, more unenlightened beliefs than than perhaps Dee would have would have seen and and. You know, they lived in fear of poverty and disease and early death. And so we have to really thank him for kickstarting the the gears that created science, which to my mind is, you know, the crowning achievement of certainly of the second millennium uh, and so far of humanity, I think. so. Well, until this until this decade right now, I mean, again, with this president, science is nothing. It's meaningless. And uh, that's terribly unfortunate. It's uh, deeply disturbing. Well, now... Here's some real exciting stuff. The rapture. <laughs> <laughs> the rapture is not a word that occurs in the Bible. Well, if you listen to certain groups of uh, far to the right, they think so. But it is a theological elaboration by John Nelson Darby of what importance is the rapture and how did it become the guiding religious myth of America? Well, that's a big question, and it's it's a it's a pretty central question to now. I mean, you mentioned Trump, and of course, it's it's deeply uh, disturbing and depressing to me to see that you know the topic of my book is not so much historical anymore because I think that we are we're on the verge of sliding back into the dark ages, and that's why it's important for us to cherish and uphold science. And it's crazy that it's even in danger and, that's and, right. and that's shocking. Exactly right. and, and so, you know, you, you might imagine that, uh, you know, I've gotten into some interesting conversations with people because you might imagine that somebody like me, who's traditionally been interested in the mystic side of life and that type of thing would be against science, but it's absolutely the opposite. I think the most important thing right now is to um, keep the, the light of science held high. And I, it, it deeply disturbs me to see the backward slide into um, ignorance and conspiratorial thinking and anti-science attitudes and superstition that uh, we're, we're seeing sweep the world. And, and, and John Dee's urge to enlighten humanity and liberate it from the tides of superstition and, and tyranny is even more <laughs> relevant than certainly a few years ago. Um, uh, but in terms of the rapture, uh, the, the, the rapture, um, okay, where do we start with this? I mean, the, the, the guiding, let's just take it back to the guiding myth of Protestantism. Uh, particularly following the 19th century, has been biblical literalism, the idea that the Bible is literally true. Mm -hmm. This is an idea that begins in John Dee's time in England and really takes off in the 19th century. It's the idea that the book of Revelation describes perfectly, is not a metaphor, it's not a story about overcoming the, you know, the war between good and evil that's in the heart of every human. It's not, you know, it's not a you know, it's 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 literal. It would be kind of it would kind of be like 
you know, people watching Star Wars and assuming it it's, you know, a documentary um, instead of a parable. But the the drive for to apocalyptic literalism has been was very much at the core of the birth of the British Empire and was at the core of the birth of the American Empire. And, you know, I cover this in detail in the book. It's the, the idea that one of the primary guiding myth of Western civilization, certainly since John Dee's time, and John Dee was a believer in this, um, but, but uh, it seems to have kind of gotten out of hand, was the idea that the second coming had to be literally directly catalyzed by human agents by enacting the Book of Revelations. And that's the idea that's still at the core of the American right. Uh, you can tell by certainly the you know watching people like Mike Pence, watching you know the moral majority that came to power in the 80s with Reagan, uh, the belief of people like Ronald Reagan and George Bush Jr. that the Second Coming was literally at hand and that wars in the Middle East were necessary to uh, uh, follow the script. Um, and uh, we can see it by the fact that, for instance, the, the Left Behind books are the most popular books in America after the after the Bible itself, I think more popular than Stephen King. And the Left Behind, the left behind books, of course, being a dramatization of the end of the world and the book of Revelation as, as if it was literally real and a literal uh, uh, combat. Uh, this is quite worrying because, you know, it's it's uh, these are the people with nuclear weapons who are willing to enforce this story at the point of nuclear warheads. And this has been the story that has been at the heart of all of America's misadventures in the Middle East. And certainly the election of Donald Trump, uh, the American evangelical right, uh, was willing to make a deal with the devil, the devil, of course, being Trump, because he to them represented their last best hope at reclaiming all of the power that they felt they had lost in American politics. Uh, with uh, the you know the, the the Clintons and then Obama uh, had, had felt they felt had had taken from them and of course the 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 right sees that as the rising tide of secular darkness and communism and all that, um, but they were willing to make a deal with Trump because they felt that you know he was a backdoor for to the, for them to get back in power and he did do that for them he put Mike Pence in office he put Jerry Falwell Jr. in office. Um, it looks very, you know, not to go on a tangent, but it, it looks very likely that a lot of their long-term goals, like the overturning of Roe v. Wade, are very likely going to happen because of uh, uh, Trump getting the Supreme Court nominee. Um, so, uh, you know, this the, America has been a back and forth between what we might consider secular or a more liberal or progressive um, views of the world, which are not irreligious, but, you know, certainly are inspired by a not sometimes, you know, a different reading of, of scripture, or very Christian in some cases, uh, between that and the apocalyptic literalism of, you know, evangelical Protestantism and the American right. And that's a thread of history that, you know, like all the things I'm mentioning on this show, you know, each one of these things is a thread that you can pull on and it, it will you, you can trace it back to hundreds of years of history and fascinating stories and of adventure and, and intrigue going back to the 16th century. And, you know, I lay out the whole story in a way that I just unveil the like as if by revelation, the the multiple hundred years of all of this coming to pass, not in a conspiratorial way, but just zooming back out on history far enough to see what's happened. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I apologize if this is kind of like you know we're, we're all over the place here, but it, well, it all not. links. It all links together. Well, we're gonna we're gonna call time out on the playing field in just a minute, but I just wanted to let you know I was I just bumped into in the middle of the night last night on the internet. Uh, Nostradamus's alleged predictions for 2018. Oh boy! And <laughs> he concluded. My ears just perked up. I'm he concluded that Trump is the Antichrist. <laughs> That's what he did. This is amazing. This is amazing. And and he acts like the Antichrist. I'll tell you that. Okay. Did well, he, does he mention Tide Pods also? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I guess that's a little that's now a little yeah. bit of an old reference, but yeah. Yeah, well, we got time out here on this playing field, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Hi, I'm Raven Garasi, author of over 20 books on inner mystery traditions and pre-Christian European spirituality. You can find out more about my work at my website, houseofgramasi.com. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Aronimus. 
Okay, now, Jason, who was Edward Kelly? So Edward Kelly was a very disreputable character. He was a psychic and and a very a very uh, one of ill repute at that. So so D we've covered and and D you probably have gotten a sense of was very intellectual and up in his head you know very very uh, analytical character and and sometimes people who are very very intellectual uh, have the problem getting in touch with the the more subtle side the, the more the emotional side of life or the intuitive side. And that's was John. That was John D's issue. He 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 knew everything there was to know about the occult, but he didn't have any intuitive gifts of his own. And so what he ended up doing was using people who were called scryers. And a scryer was a common profession in, in England at the time. A scryer is essentially somebody who, uh, you know, would go around the countryside, uh, the countryside, door to door, in some cases making predictions by looking into using a, a crystal ball to fortune tell similar and and these were very very common but not particularly looked look, not looked well on socially it's very similar to how perhaps we see you know phone psychics today or or psychics uh, who, who have the shops on on street corners and that type of thing so that was kelly's deal but kelly uh, had also been accused of many criminal deeds he'd had his ears cut off for forging and uh, was, you know, had been accused of necromancy and summoning corpses from the grave and trafficking with demons and all kinds of stuff, which was probably exaggerated, although perhaps not. And Kelly arrived at Mortlake uh, as a result of a talent scout uh, that Dee had employed to find scryers for him. And despite his kind of miasma of, of nefariousness, Kelly was extremely talented, and he was able to had very, very clear and precise psychic sight, or, or at least was good enough, you know, a good enough con man to convince D of this. And he, uh, he and D perf- uh, formed a working partnership that lasted about seven years um, of D doing magical rituals, and then Kelly going into a, a light trance state and telling D what he saw in the spirit world. So it would be Ke- so it would be D doing rituals and Kelly saying what was what was happening on the other side. And they worked like that doing sometimes three sessions a day for many years and and worked together to contact the angelic realms, or at least D believed that's what was happening. And wrote down, as I alluded to earlier, about a thousand pages of material of what the angels told them which were very complex uh, instructions for building ritual implements to make even deeper contact. And part of it was the transmission as well of what is now known as the Enochian language, or they just called it the angelic language, which was supposedly the language that angels speak and the language that humanity spoke before the fall from the Garden of Eden. It It has its own alphabet. It has hints of an underlying linguistic structure. It's been analyzed by linguists, including the linguist Donald Laycock in the 1970s, who, um, you know, was had to remain agnostic about it because it was had some impressive features of actual being an actual language. Um, and uh, then the other thing that the angels told them was that the what I alluded to earlier, which was that the end of the world was nigh. And uh, apparently it is not. It is nigh from what you mentioned about the New York Times uh, magazine yeah, uh, that, just that's... earlier, you know, and they, and they, they, the angels were quite insistent that humanity needed to repent because the end of the world was here, uh, and um, it's a whole long saga. And then they began to use D and Kelly. They they tried to get D and Kelly to convince the various monarchs of Europe to embrace the angels' plan for reunifying humanity and and redeeming mankind's sinful nature. It's 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 quite a it's quite a saga. Yeah, it certainly is. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to go back to this uh, New York Times because it, it's a real incredible piece of work. I'm just going to read a paragraph that is the end paper of it. It's its conclusion. It said, 
says, 30 years ago, we almost saved the planet. Today, a global transformation is underway. Since 1981, the Arctic sea ice has decreased by an average of 1.3% per year. Since 1989, the global mean temperature has increased by one degree Fahrenheit. By 2030, the number of people worldwide affected by floods is expected to triple. Between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected, listen to this, to cause the deaths of roughly 200 and 50,000 people each year. By 2050, the Arctic Ocean is expected to be largely ice-free in the summer. By that same year, a million species will face extinction. By 2080, the frequency of heat waves in the New York metropolitan area is projected to triple. By the turn of the next century, global sea levels will have risen by one to four feet, potentially turning hundreds of millions of people into refugees. Whoa! And that's science. And that's not at all what Donald Trump thinks or ever understands. Because he hardly reads. Jeez, a whiz. Uh, so I think it's important that people pay attention to this because uh, look around and love the people that you're with. Help other people as much as you can and pay attention especially to the children because our lives and their lives may be shortened. And this president has not helped one bit. Now, I hope we never have to talk about that guy again. Now, are you ready for another big question? Sure. I mean, where do we go after that? Well, I, do wanna, I, I, I like that you're tying this to the well, not I don't like any of that, of course, but I, I appreciate that you're tying it to current events because that's certainly how I see it. You know, it's like I wouldn't there's no point in my mind, uh, you know, all books are written about the present, whether it's a history book or a, talking about the past or a science fiction book talking about a potential future. All, all art is created about the present, and, and of course, this is you know. To, there's no point in just writing a book to understand history. The point of writing history is telling people what they need to know now. And and one of the reasons that I think we've come to this position is because people have been trying to make the apocalypse real. I mean, I think that they've had a religious mandate to. You know, this idea that it doesn't matter if the world dies. That's right. Because they're we're, gonna, we're all going to be raptured at the end. Well, what if that's not true? What well, if there's only all the a, life that there is. Only 144,000. Now, that's not too many that's going to make it. No. Uh, <laughs> well, they're all pushing and shoving each yeah. other to get on the yes, bus. Yes, through love, they are pushing and shoving <laughs> each other. <laughs> and there's another great article in the New York Times today, which Baltimoreans, everyone in Maryland should read. It says... Can Larry Hogan, that's our governor, save the Republicans? That is really something, because Larry Hogan expresses himself, our governor expresses himself, and you, uh, he, no, Trump is going to hate Larry Hogan. And uh, I'm sure he's going to jump on and try to try to uh, mess him up one way or the other. That's a, well, just as an aside, I mean, my, I mean we're, we're kind of getting off into the off territory here, but I, I do think I, I, I do want to... I will say that my intuitive feeling about things right now is that I don't think there's anything left with the Republican Party. I think that they – and it is relevant to this topic because for the longest time, the Republican Party was based on uh, Christian values and evangelical Christianity and family values and all this. And as I mentioned earlier, they did sell their souls to back Trump. But yeah. what, right now, you know, we've got you know people like Paul Ryan about out and, and things like this. Right now, the only thing that's holding the GOP together is Trump's force of personality. That's it, and he's getting you know he's 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 uh, you know he's not healthy. You know, it's like so. I think that at some point the Trump of inevitably will falter, and when that happens, I think that they'll you know they're, they're going to rush to see who can sink their fangs in first is so-called Republican allies. Uh, and at that point, I don't think there's going to be anything left of the GOP. I think that this might be the last gasp of it in a way. And whatever emerges after that, I don't know, maybe it could be worse. Maybe it could just be, you know, uh, uh, alt-right neo-Nazi uh, populist fascism. But but um, I think that this is, I think this is it for the, at least the, the evangelical right. Well, time out here on the playing field. You're going to take a break, Jason. If you got something to do, you have to twist the night away or whatever you got to do. We'll see you back in a couple minutes. Ah, our guest is Jason Louve. 
John D. and the Empire of Angels, Anakian Magic and the Occult Roots of the Modern World, Inner Traditions International, on the web at jasonlouv.com or magic.me. There. Okay. Boy, Jason, you still there? Still there. That's magic with a K, by the way. M-A-G-I-C-K, where I teach uh, magic, shamanism, ritual, all that, all that great stuff. All the great stuff. About. And uh, all the great stuff that a lot of people are going to be studying in the future because uh, things are going to change radically. <laughs> we're going to have well, to I, we're going to have to turn inwards. Let's face it. I agree. At our, this point, you know, I, I will say that you know I've been into this stuff for twenty years now, and nobody ever took it seriously. It was like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. But now <laughs> things are so everything's so twisted and desperate that people are like, you know, why not? <laughs> well, um, let's see. I have so many good questions I got to ask you. Literal readings of the scripture were inevitable consequence of the printing press. That's what I learned from you. And um I didn't want to spend much time on that, but I did want to mention that. Uh do you would you, oh, sure. would you say a couple of sentences about that though? Yeah, I think that's really that, that's very straightforward in the sense that, you know, if we look back at history, of course, the Christianity swept through Europe following the you know, conversion of Constantine to Christianity and then the conversion of the Roman Empire to, to Christianity in the in the fourth century. Uh, and the, uh, you know, all of Europe became Catholicized and and Christian, but literacy rates were, were low, I mean, or, or practically non-existent. Only the clergy was literate. Uh, the, the peasantry was too busy um, you know, tilling the fields and no, that the nobility, by and large, was some, in many cases not literate either because it was the business of the, the nobility to fight and hold territory and so on. Um, the clergy, for the most part, were the only literate class. And so, of course, they were educated in Greek and Latin and could read the Bible in Latin because it hadn't been translated into other languages. They were, they were reading it in, in the original Latin. So the standard, you know, the standard setup was you know, there would be a, you know, there would be the, the local church wherever you happen to live and the priest or the, the priests, the, the, the clergy would have access to a Bible, which would have been written in Latin. Uh, and, and they would have been essentially giving sermons and preaching from it and drawing on it for their own inspiration. But the, the lay people were not directly reading the book. They were being, it was being delivered to them by the, the clergy. And so of course that allowed for a situation in which, essentially there was an imbalance of power the clergy could say whatever they wanted yeah. they could say basically make up whatever they wanted and say it was the word of god uh, or simply you know it, they, they were just the sole source of truth even if they were being you know giving an accurate representation or there might not have been a bible at all you know there might not have been access to it so this changed radically in the uh, when the, the printing press uh, happened so of course what you know prior to this you know, when, when Europe had been totally Catholic, there was a really, you know, laid back attitude towards religion. For the most part, Europe was, uh, you know, the attitude was do what you got to do and then confess on Sunday and everything's fine. It's like, you know, it's like there was a very accepting and tolerant view of human nature um, that we, we still see in some Catholic countries. Um, not the evangelical fury that we, we that comes from from Protestantism. I'm, I'm not making a judgment on either of those religions. I'm just saying that there are certain features to each of them, but pros and cons. Um, but when the printing press happened and everyone was able to start reading the Bible for themselves, of course, you know, there were specific historical incidents like the, the Reformation and Luther and Calvin and all of this. But it was, you know, it's pretty easy to see that people read the book and then they said, wait, well, this isn't what people have been telling us. You know, this is, you know, A, this is this incredible, uh, beautiful, harrowing, terrifying book with so much information in it. It's an incredibly dense book, his, you know, the history of thousands of years. Uh, but um, people, you know, would, of course, have the idea that they would have, you know, it was the, the word of God and that therefore they had to A, take it literally and B, that what they were getting in church just wasn't matching up with what was promised on paper. I mean, this is true across the board of human experience. I mean, the, the experience never quite matches the manual, whether that's Christianity or, you know, anything in life. You know, life is not what you read in books. But of course, uh, when it's the Bible, people or when people are 
uh, operating on that as if that's the literal word of God, then of course they would take it literally. And of course they would want to literally enact it in the world. I think that's, I don't think it could have been any other way. Um, particularly since high literacy, high literacy rates were new to Europe. You know, it was one thing that for people to start reading in larger numbers, that's a huge, that's a quantum leap for humanity to then, or certainly European civilization at that time, to then expect people to understand abstract thinking and metaphor and, and literary analysis and be able to understand that what they're reading is perhaps not literally true, but is a, a parable and a metaphor about human nature. And that, for instance, the war between God and Satan in, in Revelation represents a deeper truth, uh, the truth of the, the war between good and evil in every human heart and is a, is a, uh, a dramatization of that, just like, uh, just like modern movies are in a, in a way, um, but, or, but, you know, like religions across the world are, are filled with stories like that. For instance, the Ramayana in Hinduism, the Mahabharata war or the, the romance of the three kingdoms in, in, in China, uh, you know, the, the religions all have great epic uh, stories about the battles between the gods and the demons and, and, and the fight between good and evil and ethics and morals are demonstrated to children that way. In, as a way of passing on continuity of, of culture, but uh, unfortunately, because we went got we went into literacy, uh, of course that was good. But of course, people would take it literally, and that's really where we inherit evangelical Christianity from. It's that moment when this very um, intense and often very uh, negative book, the Bible, if if you take it literally, I mean, there's some really destructive and horrifying stuff in that book, along with all the beautiful and wonderful things. Yeah. You know, it's it's that moment of the the collision of a, a newly literate, um, you know, uh, peasantry, and 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 uh, you know, a newly literate society. Let's just say, with a book that is pretty frightening if you take it literally. You know, we're still in the shadow of that. Well, we're also within, at that time period and went for centuries. Women were not allowed to read the Bible. Uh, there are stories that I've read before that that they would, uh, if they if they were found reading the Bible, they had some serious problems. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm glad that that's changed, at least uh, superficially. It's changed anyway. Sure. Well, now, I mean, I think that that medieval medieval Europe is you know there there are some parts of the Middle East that are very similar. You know, it's like what what we see in some, uh, you know, there are many many parts of the world that are still religious. You know, America is becoming one of them very quickly, but uh, there there are lots of parts of the world that are are similar to what Europe was at the time, which was uh, a, a extremely repressive theocracy. Yeah. Well, I got a real tough question for you right now, so you better get ready for this one. Oh, good. It is your contention that the angelic system of John D. and Edward Kelly has been the central core of Western esoteric tradition in its post-Renaissance form and has been at the heart of Rosicrucianism and Scottish Rite Freemasonry. The Golden Dawn, Telema. Now, I want you to elaborate on that idea, but I also wanted to point out that there has been, especially from the far right, the damning, literally, of of anyone that gets involved in any secret society like Freemasonry or Rosicrucians, uh, and that that really is uh, has been to me extremely destructive. What do you got to say about that? Yeah, absolutely. This is, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, if you're interested in the stuff and you live in America, it's never far from your mind, but. This is one of the great ironies of, of spirituality and religious history because both of these things really do come from the same place. Yep, that's right. <laughs> they're, that's right. They're, uh, they're maybe, you know, it's some sibling rivalry. But, well, first, let's, let's do this. What is the occult, right? What is Western esotericism? Because that's a big enough subject, you know. It's, it's something that's so, so poorly understood. Uh, everybody has conceptions about it, that, you know, from Hollywood or from the religious propaganda that you've mentioned. Uh, and so let's clearly define what it is. So earlier, uh, I, we talked about the great chain of being and the idea that um, one could, A, see the universe as a coherent pattern, 
essentially the idea is that if God created man and the universe in his image, then it must be intelligible and that the more you understand the world and human nature, the more you thereby fall and understand God. You know, to understand God, look at his creation and understand the patterns in it, things like mathematical constants. Why are there mathematical constants expressed all throughout nature? Is that certainly to John Dee's mind that that suggested that there was some type of guiding intelligence behind the creation of reality? And as a scientist and a magician, he thought that the more you understood reality, you know, it's like, well, you can't meet God face to face, but you can understand his creation. And by understanding his creation, you're understanding him in a mirror in a way as above so below you understand one you understand the other because of course in the bible it says god god created the earth and the heavens and created man in his image well that suggests that you know there's that all these things follow the same logic so or pattern of creation so it's really the idea that one can become closer to god by understanding one's own nature by reducing one's own sinfulness by following scripture and then by making direct experimental efforts into understanding what reality is that one can thereby understand nature if one can understand the laws by which god created everything then one can at least the hermeticist thought participate in that creation or at the very least uh, dance according to the tune if you can see the script and the writing on the walls of eternity then you can follow it and and know your role in life, and at the very least, you know, this, this is a great goal for people to know their role in life and know what's been set out for them in the divine plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out to be easier said than done because people sure. have so many distractions and and they're so easily distracted by their lower nature and that type of thing. So that's really what magic is, and and these ideas were formalized as time went on into Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, the Golden Dawn, things like that. But they were still in embryonic form during Dee's time, or not embryonic, it was all there, but it just hadn't been quite so formalized. Uh, that's really what the occult is. The occult, uh, Western esotericism is the secret spiritual tradition in Western culture, just like, you know, perhaps uh, there, you know, there are certainly secret, you know, inner esoteric traditions in other cultures. So, uh, you know, Sufism and Islam or, or Tantra and Buddhism and Hinduism and, and that type of thing. Um, and that's really what the Western esotericism is. And so D, to my mind, is the, the, the greatest practitioner of the field. He's really the central figure of the whole thing. And what, what D did is synthesize all of the intellectual streams that have been floating around Europe at that time in the occult and into a coherent whole. And then made, you know, at least to his mind, made contact with the angels and the angels claim to deliver Enochian, which is what everyone wanted. They wanted to know the primal language of reality. They wanted to know how God created existence, and the angels delivered those schematics to Dee and Kelly. What that means is that ever since, all these secret societies that have sprouted up, I mean, Dee really fulfilled the goals of the Western esoteric tradition in, in the 16th century. His work was the crowning achievement of the field, and then from there, what happened was the birth of modern science, because the same uh, fundamental uh, uh, you know, suppositions, the idea that one could change reality by e experimenting on it became modern science, and, and they just became more about the material world than the spiritual world. And then there was a clear line of evolution from alchemy and magic into science. But the spiritual side lingered on and continued in the underground, and it had to continue in the underground because of the fear of church persecution. And D. Uh, but D fulfilled the goals by delivering Enochian in a way. And so what that means is that ever since the small occult groups that have sprouted up throughout history have really been trying to come to terms with what he did. Uh, and Enochian has made its way into uh, all of these systems and particularly the Golden Dawn and, and, and Thelema. And it really wasn't until, by the way, it really wasn't until the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that people really started to make headway with Dee's work again. And, and that, of course, was the Golden Dawn and, and Crowley, who I also cover in the book. But, yeah, it's it's right there. It's the, it's the driving force of the whole thing. And the driving force of our whole thing right now is to take a break. That's what we got to do. Rules and Regulations 506 of the Penal Code. And we always pay attention to those penal codes. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier was about John Dee's library. And the size of it, bigger than anybody, <laughs> just about bigger than anybody else. And yet, and yet, he was poor. 
and he went out and bought so many books, but then he actually gave away little parts of libraries to people. Just an extraordinary soul. Hello, this is Edgar Evans Casey, the son of Edgar Casey, the famous psychic. This is 21st Century Radio, and I'm speaking with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Now, what is hermetic magic? Ah, uh, yes. Well, hermetic magic is very simple, and it's it's summarized by one lyric from a song from the '80s by the band The Smiths. Um, it's "Nature is a language can't you read?" Oh, and it's what I've alerted, alluded to earlier: the idea that everything is similar. If that really the universe is one thing, one substance, as it says in the Emerald Tablet of Herbie of Hermes. If everything is one thing, then the same signature repeats on all levels. It's very similar to a hologram. So if you take a, a and I mean not you know not a, a projected hologram, but a traditional hologram, you might remember getting baseball cards that were holographic or something yeah, like that, sure. like a, a hologram you could hold mm -hmm. and you move and it, the the image moves. Now, if you take a hologram, a printed hologram, and you cut it up, every single piece that you cut up will have the exact same image. It'll just be smaller. This is how the Hermeticists saw the world. They thought that, as William Blake said, you could contemplate eternity within a grain of sand. That the, the, the universe and man and plants and animals and God and everything follows the same structure. Uh, one way you can see this or demonstrate this to yourself, if this is perhaps alluding to something that might be true, is to look at pictures of nebulas. Um, there are tons of nebulas that look exactly like the human eye, that are indistinguishable from the iris of the, of the human eye. Now, of course, uh, so a more skeptical person would say, well, human beings see themselves in everything. I mean, you can see a human face in a wall socket also. But for the, the hermetic thinker, for the magical thinker, or perhaps the more artistic and poetic thinker, this suggested that, you know, everything is one thing, that the same signatures repeat on all levels. Uh, or, or as they would see it, that uh, if God created the universe in his own image, then you could study anything and everything in reality to understand the whole. Um, you know, as if, 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 if man is created in God's image, then one can study man to understand God and, and vice versa. So, the old as above, so below. Medicine. Excuse me, I, I, I just uh, yelled out there. The old as above, so below. Reference. That's right. Well, what were angelic conversations? So the angelic conversations were the sessions that Dee and Kelly had, uh, where Hermeticism was really a, a philosophy. By the way, it, it had been. It was a philosophy that was kind of the forerunner of science and was in the, uh, you know, popular among the Euro the intellectual elite in Europe, uh, but not for the masses. It was kind of something that people were interested in behind closed doors because the, the church was not particularly fond of it. Um, but uh, operative magic was something else completely. You know, hermeticism, if hermeticism was a philosophy, I like to look at it like this. If we see the universe as a computer, as, as many people from this time did in a sense, um, if the universe is a computer, then hermeticism was an attempt to understand the operating system by which it runs. You know, it, people mm -hmm. thought that if they could just understood, understand how the universe works, they would be able to properly um, fit themselves within it and, and, and know what reality is. I mean, this has been the eternal quest of man, understand what, you know, what's the meaning of life, right? But they, they literally saw the universe as, a, as a, like a computer operating system, and they wanted to understand what, where all the files and folders went and how things ran and all that, and, and how things were, why things happened, you know, the, the programs that carry things out, which they saw as angels and spirits and that type of thing. You know, it's no mistake that we talk about the phrase daemon, you know, daemons in computers, you know, it's very mm -hmm. similar to the demons or Socrates' daemon. Anyways, if hermeticism is trying to find the operating system of reality, then operative magic is trying to hack it and change the code and write computer programs that do new and novel things and actively change it. And that was a much more shocking idea to people than just hermeticism. It was an even more underground idea and a more potentially dangerous and even fatal one um, because people who were into this into this were not looked kindly upon 
Although behind closed doors, every government in, in Europe was employing operative magicians to carry out their own uh, uh, desires, you know, using occult techniques, mm -hmm. John Dee being one of them. Yeah. So the angelic sessions were Dee's attempt. Now, we have to remember that Dee was the, the most highly trained scientist of his day, the, the brightest individual, the most advanced mathematical thinker, at least in England. And you have to it was it's fascinating to see somebody with a mind like that a trained scientist bring that intellect and that level of rigor to the field of the occult because the, the type of people that usually become interested in the occult um, are are not so um, intellectually erudite or well trained or scientifically minded it's actually a very very rare thing so d brought a whole new level of rigor and precision to it and the results were the angelic conversations from which they retrieved the Enochian system and the Enochian language, uh, which were written up in these various uh, uh, books, which were, you know, are now in the British Library and that have been drawn upon for, uh, by all these occult groups uh, to, to try and resurrect what, what they can of Dee's work. Well, I, I, I love that part of your books when you're talking about some of the conversations, because it seemed to me that the angels really were pretty demanding, weren't they? They were. They weren't. They were, they were not just sitting around, to allowing you to say or do any, anything you wanted. Absolutely, uh, the angels were. You know, very Old Testament. From the perspective of the angels, they didn't really care how smart he was, because <laughs> for them, you know, and this is the the great, you know, quite humorous in a way. So you have to imagine somebody like D with, you know, all his intellectual training and library and all that. All of that, all that was, all that was sufficient for for, was to create a footstool that he could kind of stand on to see slightly higher than the other, you know, humans around him so that he could just begin to reach towards making contact with the angels. But of course, the angels are a whole other arc of evolution higher than humanity, at least in the medieval way of thinking uh, or Renaissance way of thinking. And so their intelligence was, you know, is far beyond humans. And so but the, from the perspective of the angels, all humans are sinful and fallen without exception. You know, it's, it's, they right. pretty much straightforward repeat the things that are in the, in the Bible. So they were consistently furious with Dee and Kelly and humanity <laughs> in general. And their, their opinion was simply that humans were sinful and fallen and needed to repent. And this was the most yeah. important thing because the end was at hand. And of course, you know, people always look at ideas of the apocalypse. Everyone's always saying the apocalypse is coming and it never comes. But in my in my way of thinking, they're just look they're 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 not zooming out far enough. You know, I think that if if things like you know, I'm agnostic, but if things like spirits and angels and so forth really exist, they very likely see time very differently than human beings. Human beings have very short lifespans, 70, 80 years, yeah. you know, and that's it. Yeah. But it, for an angel or a, or a being that is in theory around for thousands of years, they very likely see time very differently. So when an angel says the end of the world is nigh, repent in 1580, 1585, it of course may, follows logically that nothing would happen that year and the human beings hearing that would be quite disappointed and disillusioned. But just pull back a little bit. Here we are, it's 2018 and you've just said that, you know, the New York Times has said that we've passed the, the threshold for any potential to save the world. So were they wrong or were they just speaking on a longer time frame? And what is the apocalypse really? You know, is it like a Hollywood type event like they think in the Left Behind books where, where the, the heavens open up and angels and demons literally duke it out for humanity? Or is it something that takes place over a very elongated time span in a very subtle way in which in which people have many, many, many chances to change and take a new path, but usually don't let's be honest and it's you know is it a slow long degradation of ma the natural world and mankind and human dignity and human institutions and and mankind's connection with the divine realms a slow slide into oblivion you know rather than some hollywood type one-off event well i'm going to change course here for just a minute my favorite research on Dr. John D. and I know he wasn't really a, a doctor, I would have given him five PhDs, um, is that uh, 
found in the in the research books of Dame Frances Yates, who was my most favorite until I bumped into your book. What was her oh, thank perspective? You. She, she's wonderful, isn't she's wonderful. she? Oh gosh, that's really? that's that's quite a compliment, by the way. Thank you. Well, so much. but it's true. It's true you, because the the perspective I needed uh, was was a, a bit more scientific than hers uh, from that standpoint, and, I, and that's what I know you understand, and that's really really key. Uh, but you know, but she was such a lovely lady, and and uh, but could you tell us? Uh, uh, what was her perspective on John D? But I'm still going to call him Doctor John D. Sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It sounds cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Dame Frances Yates, a brilliant, brilliant academic, uh, just centrally important to both. You know, she's centrally important to our understanding of history and science, but also. Uh, you know, she was an academic in, in the in the fifties and sixties and seventies, and without her, there would be no real act. There would be no serious academic study of of the occult. It would have remained written off to history. Basically, what she her the Yates thesis, as it's called, her real contribution to the, to the field outside of many brilliant brilliant books. You know, the main her main thesis was that science was born out of alchemy. You know, prior to her work, people thought that alchemy was an aberration, that it wasn't in continuum, in continuum with anything else, that there was just this crazy thing that people believed, and it was just pure superstition. And what she revealed through her work and her, her academic work is that actually uh, it was all one continuum, you know, that there was alchemy and magic and and the ideas of alchemy and magic were slowly refined into modern science and it makes perfect sense it's just like like the, the you know the more fantastic things that you read in the grimoires or people like cornelius agrippa that you know the conjurations of demons and the, the direct alteration of reality and things like this you know people were often disappointed when it didn't work but the same general ideas, the idea that you could change reality, the idea that you had to undertake operations or rituals, this just became scientific experiments. You know, the alchemist chamber became the, scient the scientist laboratory, and people just began to refine the methods and refine the philosophy over time, and they began to, to focus more on the material world. And yeah, they never learned how to turn lead into gold, but just because that didn't quite work out for them, I mean, the same people who were trying to solve that problem went on uh, unsuccessfully, you know, went on to or inspired other people who went on to successfully solve other problems like the creation of the telescope, uh, the birth of modern medicine, the creation of Francis Bacon's uh, the Baconian method, which became the scientific method. And so Francis Yates basically said, uh, you know, alchemy is the parent of science uh, and and that revolutionized the entire field and it was the first time that the academia began to was forced to really seriously take a look at magic and say actually she's right i mean this is a whole part of history that we have just been uh we we've ignored and it's not like nothing happened before the creation of the royal society you know um, mm -hmm. so that's the Yates thesis. And, and then she went on to talk at length about the philosophy of people like Giordano Bruno and John Dee and Francis Bacon and 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 really showed how at, during the time science and spirituality were united. And there was what, really one intellectual quest. And this is the way that I see it, too. You know, there is one true intellectual quest, the pure intellectual quest, whether it's of science, of magic, of of art, of literature, or whatever it is. And that's to. Um, you know, redeem humanity, to enlighten humanity, to improve the lot of humanity. And the perspective that people had at the time is the tools didn't matter. You know, whether it's science or magic, you know, they saw it all as one thing. It was a, it was a whole, it was a holism. Mm -hmm. uh, now things are very much specialized and compartmentalized. And in a way, that's a great tragedy because when we're young, when we, when we still, when we haven't had the curiosity beaten out of us yet, that's how we see the world. We, we just see it as we have pure intellectual curiosity and we long to see everything in the world as one whole. Um, but it's, you know, then as time goes on, we're, we're forced to focus just on one tiny corner of reality, whatever our job happens to become and, and what role we end up playing in society. And, and then, of course, within the sciences, things are so specialized now that, you know, scientists are not certainly the way that the structure works. 
it, it, it just doesn't make sense financially to know everything, you know, nor is it possible anymore. So, you know, now people are become very, very specialized and are on, within their own track and in their own world. And there's wonderful, wonderful things about that. Well, I, we, I love the idea of whole system thinking. Yeah, you know, well, we have to put that on pause there. We're running out of time, and I've got so many more questions. You're so good at this. Congratulations. You just won a free trip to Bermuda and uh, maybe a new haircut. Do you need a new haircut? I very much need a new haircut Absolutely. and a trip to Bermuda. That would be lovely. Yeah, <laughs> we'll try to put them both together. But time out here on the playing field with Jason Move. This is Elaine Pagels, author of the Gnostic Gospels and also of a new book called Revelations, Visions, Prophecy, and Politics in the Book of Revelation. I'm a professor of religion at Princeton University, and you are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hirano. Boy, did she teach me a lot. Well, another person that's taught me a hell of a lot is Jason Move, and he's with us now, and we're, we're in the last all 20 minutes of, of the show. I wish we had more time, uh, but we don't. John D. and the Empire of Angels... So let's get back to uh, Jason here. Jason, we're in the few, we're in the last minutes of this, Jason, and uh, I've got to be careful about my questions here. Um, Anakian magic, well, how does it work? Oh, well, <laughs> by the way, how cool to hear from Elaine Pagels. Her book, Revelations, was very, very helpful was it? In, uh, yeah. uh, in my research. She's great. She's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so Anakian magic. Uh, Enochian magic, in my experience, is the one type of magic that works like it does in the movies, meaning you read something from a, you know, an incantation from a page and something dramatic happens. And by something dramatic, I mean a radical alteration in your perceptions of reality. Um, Enochian is a, a, a vast and, you know, massive system. It's, it's hard to encapsulate, but learning it is very similar to learning some type of advanced computing, uh, computer programming language or something like that. Um, or perhaps learning the, the intricacies of how a physical computer is put together along with learning the programming language in the case of the Enochian language. Um, it, Enochian is a system for taking uh, an unevolved human being, uh, you know, a very animalistic uh, in outlook human being, and enlightening them. It's, it's the closest system that Western magic has to what the Eastern systems call enlightenment, and they have yogic techniques and, and various other meditative techniques for getting there. Western magic has a Nokian, which is a very direct path, uh, so direct that it can be quite apocalyptic in a sense. Apocalyptic meaning uh, the, the person that goes into a Nokian magic does not come out the same person on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, the narrative that one takes into that of who, who they are doesn't get to survive. So it's it's not it's not a light matter. It's not for dabblers. Uh, it's for somebody who wants to be enlightened and know the truth, and the truth not meaning a dogma or a religion or some something that you can write down, but understanding the fundamental nature of reality. Um, that's what Anukian does. It it's a, it it, uh, it provides revelation, if done sincerely, and it takes quite a bit of effort, although. You know, it can happen very quickly as well. So to my mind, Enochian is, you know, the, the central most and perhaps most valid form of magic in the Western canon. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of uh, aspects to it. It's, uh, it's phenomenally complex and also very straightforward and simple. What is the importance of Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica and why did Dee believe that revealing the mysteries of the monas to the profane would lead to their misuse and therefore to disaster. Yes. So the monas hieroglyphica is, was really kind of Dee's thesis in a way. It was his, the crowning achievement of his academic work. And it's, a sim, it's both a symbol and a book. It's a, it's a symbol that he dis, believed he distilled the entirety of reality down into and the key of the mysteries and the key of alchemy and, he, and the key of understanding what reality is. And he presented it, he presented it to the various monarchs of Europe, including Maximilian II, uh, or Maximilian I, rather, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, he presented it to him as containing the secrets of alchemy, but to Dee's mind, the secrets of alchemy meant the secrets of enlightenment, the secret of turning a soul from lead to gold. But monarchs of Europe weren't interested in that. They just wanted something that would make gold. 
So they weren't particularly interested in the Monas. And this is one of the reasons why D kept his things coded and secret, because he understood human nature. He, he understood that human beings are fundamentally greedy and, and um, not particularly concerned with the higher heights of philosophy or spirituality. They just want to get ahead and get ahead at the cost of the people around them. So the, the secrets of magic can sometimes, uh, uh, you know, be a bit dangerous in the hands of people like that, uh, or certainly just profaned and misused and made tacky. Let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. So he uh, he kind of he he so he he wrote in a way that made it very hard to interpret if you didn't have his background, and that was good and bad. It was good because he achieved his goal of keeping the secrets out of the hands of the profane. Although it was bad in the sense that nobody understood what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and, and D was perpetually ignored for his entire life and, and no one understood him or took him seriously because he just wasn't very good at communicating his ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, you state that queen Elizabeth the first was a genius. D's equal or better. And she practiced operative Magic in her own ways, such as the royal touch. What was the royal touch? The royal touch was a, a healing ritual where people could, on a certain day, they could line up at, I believe, either Whitehall or Buckingham Palace if they had maladies like toothaches or, you know, a bad knee or something like that. And, and Elizabeth would lay her hands upon them. You know, it's kind of like, you know, laying on of hands and, and many people, it was like faith healing. And many people claim that they were cured of maladies this way. Now, uh, clearly, we, we have to take that with more than a grain of salt because the, clearly there's a lot of showmanship there and a lot of power of suggestion. And it's the queen, after all. It's, it's got to be a heightened experience to go through something like that. But we also have to imagine that it wouldn't have been very wise to run around saying that the queen had it healed you, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, that would have been treason <laughs> and right. you would have been put in the tower of London or, or just killed. So, yeah. so yeah, that, that, that's probably biased data. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, this question is uh, something that I wish we could have a lot of time on. And that is the British empire was not without its atrocities. What were some of its worst atrocities yeah well we i mean we gotta bear in mind the british empire at its height controlled a fourth of the planet it was called the empire the sun upon which the sun never sets for a reason so the sun was always up somewhere in its territories and it was you know the the, the english brutally uh conquered a lot of the world yeah and and uh you know the body count was much higher than you know i think the body count on the british empire was perhaps higher than uh, certainly World War II, it was, it was higher than, than Hitler or I believe Stalin, um, at a, you know, cause it was all over the world, but some of the worst ones, I, you know, the, the one, the ones that particularly stand out, there's so many, um, but the, the, the Bengal, the famine in Bengal, you know, 19 million Bengalis were, were starved, uh, you know, under, under the Raj, um, there were insurgencies and, uh, you know, very cruelly put down in Papua New Guinea and Australia. Um, you know, of course, if we see the the uh, if we see America as in some senses an extension of the British Empire, you know, then we have to factor in all of the genocides of the the genocide of the, the Native American Indians. Yeah. Uh, you know, which yeah. is incalculable. They just, they just, you know, there's no way to get a precise number on it, um, particularly because of the spread of smallpox and things like that. So a lot of the world was, you know, brutally, uh, you know, there was some very, very big, some huge atrocities. And, you know, some there have been some historians, particularly Neil Ferguson, Neil Ferguson, who have said that the British Empire, despite all that, was still the most humane and liberal of all the empires, and that the other the other world empires, particularly Spain and the French, were were far more savage, and that you know it was you know England, the English Empire was the best of all possible empires. But mm. you know he's he's very iconoclastic. Um, <laughs> you know the the truth is a lot of people died and a lot of people suffered, and a lot of it was done in the name of the spread of Christianity and the, the civilizing force of England and that, you know, that England was here to civilize and save the world. 
And that's real. I mean, we still live in the, the shadow of that suffering. And of course, it wasn't just the English. It was all the imperial powers. But we can't ignore that either. I mean, the, the, the death toll was massive. And by the way, a lot of the death toll we just don't know because the, the British um, Foreign Office illegally destroyed a lot yes. of the, the files for yeah. it in the 1960s. That's happening now, by the way. I mean, Trump is very busy destroying a lot of the records of his administration. So yeah. we're, we just, we, you know, there's a lot when, when the history books are written, there's a lot about the Trump administration that we just may not know. We may not ever know the extent of, for instance, what they've done at the border or what they've done to um, people trying to come into the country and things like that, you know. And yeah. I suspect that there's a lot of what's happening right now we don't know about and, and will come out and, and people will ask, how could this have happened? Well, you know, right under our noses. Well, it's like people have been telling us that this, is, this has been happening, but we haven't been paying attention to the things like concentration camps being built in America for right. uh, people trying to come into the country and this type of thing. And so it's very likely that we, just as an aside, you know, just because history does repeat, and that's the point of studying history, um, it's, it's very likely that a lot of, you know, more information will come out, but it's it's possible that we may not ever know the, the extent of what's happening right now because Trump, much like the British Empire, uh, you know, the Trump administration is very actively shredding their files and destroying records of what their administration has done. I think because they know their time is limited and as soon as their power wanes, you know, it's, it's you know, they're going to have to watch, uh, you know, th and, things will be very different. Well, there certainly is. And the Republican Party will be destroyed which is very unfortunate because uh, I knew a lot of good Republicans and still am friends with some, but they, none of them like Trump, though, from that standpoint. It is, uh, it is unfortunate, and that's what I was alluding to. I, I think that the, the core, the, the good core of the Republican Party, you know, the, the, the good fiscal, the, 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 the compassionate conservatism, if you will, I mean, maybe not even that, but... The, the, We're out of time. Uh, We're out of yeah, time. Okay. Thank you for joining us, Jason. Hang on the line. And that's the show. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Courtner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington. And I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus.